just open up. Oh, I don't know. It said that uh, out loud to me. I started recording. Sorry. I oh, know okay. Yeah. yeah. Everybody, but hello. <laughs> I'm glad recording. that it tells you that, hey, you're now all on. Uh, yeah. They yeah. Didn't say Cannon yeah. will be held against you forever. in the court of Matchbox. Yeah. Uh, so if you guys want to, you can go ahead and open up Tinkercad to follow along so you can get like the general idea of how everything works. And if you guys have questions at any point, don't mind interrupting me or just shouting them out because, hey, you're here to learn. Okay, so the way you navigate around Tinkercad is middle mouse to drag, and then you right click to rotate around. It's pretty similar to anything, any other software where you have to move around in a 3D space, basically. You can also click these different faces on the box to get different views, which is really helpful when you're trying to size stuff out. Yeah, and so, there are a lot of shapes in Tinkercad. That's one of the best things about it. So you can see they have everything from furniture to customizable shapes to connectors that you can 3D print, make like little toys and action figures out of. But what we're gonna stick with today are the basic shapes. Now, moving these shapes around and messing with them is just like pretty much shapes in PowerPoint, if you were to think of it like that. Like you have your simple stuff like copy, paste, duplicate, delete, and then obviously your undo and redo buttons. And then also if you want to flip and mirror it so that the way, it, here I can be a better example using a hole right here. This right here will mirror it to the side, which is a useful tool when you're working with holes. Now getting to that, the way Tinkercad works is based on what are called Boolean operations, which is basically when you take two objects and subtract one from the other. So there are two types of objects here. There are the holes and then there are your solid objects. And so the holes are just what they sound like. Once you group them together with this button or control G, it will take effect and slice a bit out of the model. And so oh, with holes, you can do a lot more than you think. This is one of actually my first 3D models on Tinkercad. And as I ungroup it, you'll start to see all the different holes that went into making it. And it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. I've seen a complete replica of R2-D2 made just on Tinkercad. People can get ridiculously good at this. And so the other thing about the shapes are these sliders right here. So you can, for example, round off the corners by using this radius tool. And while we're doing that, I can actually show you one of the building blocks of 3D modeling what are called faces. So all objects are made out of faces. As you can see, these little like square boxes here. And now those are always gonna be either like squares, hexagons, triangles, rectangles. It really depends. But all 3D models, no matter what, are made up out of just a ton of smaller faces. And that's not really important when it comes to Tinkercad, but for all future 3D modeling, that becomes a huge part of it. Also with those sliders, you can change a lot of things on stuff like stars, where you can make the radius bigger, change the inner radius, and add a ton of points, which honestly, believe it or not, isn't a feature in a lot of 3D modeling softwares where you can mess around with shapes like this, making Tinkercad pretty unique for some things. So uh, if all you guys have Tinkercad open, just put a cube down and mess around with it for a sec, just trying to figure out the movement because it, it's pretty self-explanatory. You grab these black little boxes to make it larger, smaller, and you can always edit the dimensions by just typing them in. So if you pull that out, go ahead and get your box and just try subtracting a few things from it to make some random shape, whatever you feel like. 
and through grouping it, just kind of get a general feel for the software. While you're doing that, also remember you can move around models using the arrow keys just as you can by dragging them. And honestly, I find it easier to use the arrow keys when you're going for smaller dimensions because the only issue with Tinkercad is it's kind of hard to line stuff up sometimes. So like if you're boring a hole through something, it might not be in the exact center, unfortunately, but you can at least try. And to make the snap amount smaller, you just go down here to the bottom right of the screen and you can make it anything from five millimeters to 0.1 millimeters. So, so far, do you guys have any questions about Tinkercad or navigating it? No, I mean, nope. other than, can you scale it um, across the board? Like if I make one side, can I make it 50% bigger, 100% bigger? I know you can nope. hold down shift to do it, but I, there's no like percentage that I can type in. Does that yeah. Sound? Yeah, there's no way as far as I'm aware. Like James said, if you hold down shift, it will move the whole object or I mean, it will scale the whole object instead of just the corner or just the side. But one of the other drawbacks of Tinkercad is you can't scale it by a certain amount or by a percent, which a lot of 3D modeling and even slicer softwares have nowadays. And I hope that Tinkercad will get that. But okay, that brings us to our first little challenge that I want you guys to try out. So through using holes and just general shapes, try making a little house. And I'm gonna give you guys like five or so minutes to do that. It doesn't have to be great, but the best way to get better at modeling is just to try it out. So go ahead and make a little house and then I'd like to see how you guys do, maybe share the screens. And if you have any questions while you're doing it, feel free to ask. Is, is this the Bob Ross portion of this, of this walkthrough, the happy, happy little yeah. Tinker Cat houses? Yeah, you gotta make your own. <laughs> I'm having a lot of happy little accidents here. I don't know if they're actually happy though <laughs> um one thing i i do i use ticker cat every once in a while and if you look at like say the one shape you can look to see how tall it is and then you can click another shape if you want it to fit directly on top of that and tell it to and then click that black arrow and then you can actually put in the same number that the other one was as tall and it will put it exactly even which is yeah. kind of nice i use that a decent amount i don't know if that makes sense to you guys I'm making a house and it's going to look awesome. <laughs> oh, and you can also click a shape and drag, but hold alt and it will make a copy of that shape. How do you move an object in uh, Z space? Uh, you use that little arrow above the object. When you click on it, it will either be above or below, depending on your perspective. Yeah, gotcha. a little black arrow. I see. Thank you. I actually did not know about that alt thing. Oh, yeah. Huh. We did alt making copies is amazing. Huh. Make them copies. <laughs> if you hold down shift as well, it makes makes it keeps it in the same plane when you're dragging it. It's alt shift, huh. which is also use, really useful. Okay. Okay, yeah. How's everyone house is coming along? Good. I forgot to put a door in it though, so I suppose I should put a door. Okay. 
Who needs doors? Yeah, exactly. Doors are so 2020. <laughs> Back when we had to go outside or didn't go outside, we need we need doors. Couldn't be me. <laughs> okay. I'm ready to share my screen. Okay. I have to stop sharing mine. There it is. Cool. Dan, hold on one second. Okay, well, he's not going to make it. Back to Tinkercad and... Oh, share screen. No, I got you. Uh, Tinkercad does not have an Android app. It's just an online, uh, like, Chrome or however you want to use it. Can you see this right now? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the house I made, and there's my door. And I don't know why I made circles there, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. Okay. Cool. Anybody else want to share theirs? <laughs> while I got you, while people were figuring out or still drawing, with the um, the draw function on this one i forget what it's called i think it's just um, draw it's scribble right oh. yeah. have you use that much um i've gotten mixed results with it any tips on using that honestly like i'd say it's for very specific purposes okay. which i haven't really found yet like I don't really know what you would use it for. I've used it in the past just to like add some detail to something. But other than that, it's definitely kind of a weird specific circumstance tool. But if you're like people use it was just for like filigree cutouts and stuff like that. Like yeah. very, very niche stuff. Or putting like letters or stuff like that into it as like a engraving. I could see I could definitely see using letters, but yeah, it's, it just, it seems like it should be more powerful of a tool than I can get it to work, than I can use it. Oh, well. The text is cool, though. The text works really well. Yeah. How's your house coming along, Benji? Oh, it's fit for a king. Sweet. Nice. Okay. Well, moving on then. So something I want to show y'all is kind of the limitations of Tinkercad. For example, with this house, if I wanted to get rid of this little piece, I can't really do that easily because even if I do a hole where it's through here using this object, it won't separate this into two objects. It'll still just be one connected object and I can't really get rid of that. But on most 3D modeling softwares, you could just throw a sketch right here and extrude and get rid of that pretty easily. But there are some other things that Tinkercad makes a little hard. So say I wanted a chamfer on these edges, which it, if you're not aware, a chamfer is just when you put a 45 degree angle usually on an object. And in this occasion, I'll just be using a hole. So instead of being able to just click on each corner and add a chamfer to it, I have to individually do this with the whole function. And the way I usually will move a hole from one side to the other to repeat it is I'll just duplicate the object and then mirror it that way. And then make sure I have the right one selected, clicking that and then ungrouping it and deleting it. And then having to group it with this one, which is a pretty tedious process when I could just, here, I'm gonna switch you over to Fusion real quick. For example, on Fusion, if I wanted to do the same thing, I would just put a box and add chamfers on every corner 
and then just extrude it from there, which isn't a feature Tinkercad has. Does Fusion let you pick um, existing shapes and drop it in or no? No. Uh, you can make some shapes through these right here, like the box, cylinder, sphere, torus, coil, pipe, but that's it. And unless you're getting them off of the internet, like some random online database, it's going to be kind of hard to use other people's objects. So that's also a drawback of Fusion is you have to make everything you want to use. You can't just simply drop in a shape like a heart or a star or a isohedron. <laughs> so Isn't that why Fusion is just not typically used for a lot of things. The editing properties are just kind of whack. Well, honestly, not many softwares are good for editing. Uh, do you mean like editing other models or editing? Yeah, like so like editing a model, for example, in the case of 3D, like 3D printing to like split up a model and design it to have, you know, holes for bolts or alignment pegs or stuff like that. Yeah, so Fusion is really bad with using other models because just like I was talking about earlier, the mesh data, it doesn't interpret the object as a solid object. It just sees it as that an object made up of a bunch of triangles. And if you have anything okay. over 30,000 triangles, you can't convert it to a solid object in Fusion. And a lot of my designs will have upwards of 300,000 triangles. So right. that should say, yeah. yeah. like. It's pretty rough to mess around with, but yeah. it works. It works. But like on that same note, most modeling software is like any other. No, they, they really don't have much support for it unless it's a specific software like Blender or Mesh Mixer. They don't mm -hmm. really have built in mesh environments that work very well. They, I feel like a lot of them just kind of add that environment because they feel like they have to. And the finished product is never really that good. And if you wanna make any change, it will usually take your computer 20 minutes to load it. So it, it's pretty rough on Fusion. But that's one thing about Tinkercad that you don't have to worry about. Tinkercad will allow you to cut holes in models, slice models in half, do things like that. That would be relatively hard on a lot of expensive or commonly used slicing software, or not slicing, but modeling softwares. So when you have an object that you're happy with and you wanna print it, you just go over to export and you choose an STL. So STLs, like I was just talking about, is basically just a non-solid object. It's just made an object made up of a bunch of those little triangles. But when I put it into slicing software, it knows that I want it to be a solid object. Can you all see that? So this is Prusa Slicer and in my personal opinion, I find it to be the best of the slicers. There's also Kira, which is fairly common, but over the last year or so, Prusa has built in support for the Ender and the CR10 and a lot of other printers that it previously couldn't slice for. And it allows you to do a lot of things that most softwares don't, like painting on supports and painting on where you want the layer changes to happen. It's overall a very versatile software. And so being able to print on it is pretty simple because pretty much everything is already figured out for you in these profiles. You just, for example, choose whether you want it to be detail, draft, or normal. And with the enders, any of those settings work perfectly you don't really have to make any changes. And so if you wanted to, for example, print on one of the enders in the makerspace, all you have to do is throw your file in here, select that, and 
I always recommend with enders to put rafts on them. And rafts, or as I used to call them, waffles, are basically just 3D printed layers that the object can then print on top of. Because layer adhesion is not always the easiest thing for a printer to do. And you want the bottom of your print looking nicer. So instead of it printing directly on the surface, it's gonna print on a little raft. And so I'd say three layers is by far good enough for pretty much anything. So do you guys have any questions about slicers so far? Okay. Well, um, one, qu one question. Yeah, what's up? Um, so, was so it's only been a re fairly recent thing that Prusa has started support for other machines, correct? Uh, I'd say about like a, a year, year or two. Ago. Yeah, like two years ago is when they added the Ender, and that was like the okay. first printer they added. And if you guys are unaware, the Ender is pretty much the most popular printer in the world because they're cheap and they're workhorses. And so they had originally Ender profiles that were pretty garbage, honestly. Like I tried using them for a while, but I, I couldn't really get anything to print very well. But since then, they've just been constantly updating it. And now if I go in here, you can see that they have, oh wait, oops. They don't make it easy to add a printer, <laughs> but they have support for, oh man, I have the not updated version. <laughs> but if you're on the most updated version, you'd be seeing every single Creality printer. And then they're adding support to for like Wolves bots and Ooh, even Delta printers now. I didn't know that. That's impressive. But yeah, basically, Prusa Slicer is just becoming a more versatile program, and it works great for uh, enders. So any file you want to slice will work pretty well for this. But getting to the other basics of using Prusa Slicer, this right here will arrange your models in the best way possible. But I, I want to say it's always the best. You can rotate them to make the arrangement fit better because like if you have a bunch of models you don't want them all necessarily facing the same direction if you're trying to fit as many as you can on there right but i'm going to throw in an object that needs supports okay i'm going to throw in my bread and butter the appa but <laughs> when models aren't completely closed off like i was talking about with that mesh sometimes there are little holes in the mesh that you can't even see with the naked eye or just by looking around so another good feature of the prusa slicer is it will repair these models for you without really doing any damage to them and even when i have like regular models from sculpting that have errors i just throw them in here to repair the errors and put it back out because a lot of softwares just won't take models with errors. Yeah, that's good. That's really good that it's able to just take care of it without you having to do a bunch of work. Yeah, and so when you're printing, you really wanna focus on whether something needs supports or not. And pretty much whenever it's an overhang that's more than 45 degrees, I recommend adding supports. With this, obviously, you're gonna have supports on pretty much the whole thing. Oh, I have a note in the chat. Okay. Um, so to add supports, you can add it from the build plate only, or you can add them everywhere. And so with this, you would probably add them everywhere just for the sake of making sure it prints perfectly. But on the build plate still seems to work pretty well, actually. Now, one of the other cool features of Prusa Slicer is say I know this part, for example, even though it obviously won, it could print without supports. I can go back here, right click. And add a modifier or add a support enforcer, support blocker. 
So what I'm going to add right here is a support blocker. And so this will basically make it so that it can't print support in this area. And on that note, you can actually add modifiers that work the same way, but you can change things like the layer height, you can change the temperature, the speed, pretty much anything about the print you can have changed for any specific area. I've started using this a lot more recently. Like say I wanted this tail to be stronger, I could add a modifier to make sure it has more infill compared to the rest of the model, which doesn't sound like a lot, but this has been something that hasn't been in slicing softwares for pretty much ever since I started using them. So it's a pretty new feature and it's something that I think will become more and more prevalent. Yeah, I mean, that's awesome for what we do a lot of the times because we want certain parts to be strong and we can just infill them like 100%, but we don't want to infill the whole thing 100%. Can you run down through, um, I guess, just a, a quick example of why you would do that? I guess kind of what I was just saying, like maybe his horns need to be 100% infill and like how you would do it. Yeah, here I'm pulling up a model real quick to see if sure. I can find something. Okay, here's a good one. Oh, wrong snail. <laughs> wrong snail? Yeah, I got a lot of snails. I was on about here. to say, I don't know how many times. Yeah, that's a better that snail. To yeah. um, so, for this model, this is a pretty good example of when you'd use a modifier. Because I want this to print as fast as possible, for example, if I'm selling it. And so, the modifier that I'll add will just be up here to make it slower while it's printing the face and these little, oh, it's eyes, I guess. So I would just do that by adding that box there. And then you go over to the generic box on the menu and click this little settings icon to change. And actually, wait, no, not the info. <laughs> Here's the parameters. Oops. Okay. I believe ch being able to change the speed is actually a feature on the latest update because <laughs> I'm not seeing it here. Sorry, I got that on my desktop back home. But yeah, so that's an example of what you'd use a modifier for. Also, say you have a print that you want to slice in half, you can use this tool right here to slice any model directly in half and make two models out of it. And with it- that's Super awesome. Yeah, you can choose, yeah, exactly what Z height you want the cut to be at. And yeah, it's really convenient. It, it even yeah. does it better than a lot of other regular modeling softwares that have that same feature. So that also, we've used that before here. Where we've tried, we've done that. I know um, if a print fails, you can measure the print that you've got, like the, the failed piece. Like so if like it stopped printing or if it ran out of filament or whatever, you can measure and cut with that tool. Yeah. The part if you yeah, exactly. Print the whole piece again. And that's pretty simple to do too. I thought that was going to be harder. Yeah, that's that's very simple. Oh yeah. It's not yeah. more simple to do than mesh mixers. Yeah, the mesh mixer one will crash your computer like half the time. <laughs> <laughs> but here, I'm going to pull up. Okay. Jeez. All right, it's a little hard to navigate when you have a billion files. Okay. So here's one of my old Christmas ornaments from last year. And now I'm gonna teach you guys about color change. Also, I before I get there, uh, down in the bottom right, you can change the scale pretty easily just by typing it in. And if you unlock it, then you can change the scale in one direction and it won't affect the other ones, which can be useful in some situations. But Wait, if you say that one more time. So if you unlock it, then you can change the scale in one direction oh, without okay. affecting yeah, yeah, yeah. the others. Okay. I thought it was something else, but yeah. Yeah. 
And also down below it, you can see that if you, you can change the specific measurements too, which is pretty convenient. So to do a, basically for models like this, I'll just make one part higher than the other. And you can do that in modeling if you want to do a color change. So you'll have to slice it first. And then this little slider off to the side, you just drag it down to where you want the color change to happen. And I see that, oh, that's good. So I just will put it right here. And then boom, the pr that looks pretty terrifying, but the printer will stop at that point. So you can unload the filament, put in your new color filament, and voila, you got a two color print. That's very cool. Can you do more than two? Yeah, you can do literally as many as you want. Okay. Like I've had one of my models that the person who had to print it wasn't really happy with have like seven in it, I believe. So with those color changes and if you get it figured out pretty good, you can make things that you wouldn't think you could make on a one color 3D printer. Like you can get a lot of detail in there. You can even do shading, which is what I had on that one I was talking about, which is really cool. Yeah. So, so is it possible? So is it, it, does it just have to be done by the Z height layer? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. And it's pretty easy to see like where you'd want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So now getting back to the internet, show you guys how you can download Fusion 360 for the future. Because Fusion 360, one of the great things about it is that you can get a hobby license for free. And Personally, I just use a student license because, you know, I can. Uh, the only downside of the, for personal use, Fusion 360 is that you can only store 10 active models, which Fusion 360 works in the cloud. So those 10 models will be in the cloud, but if you download them and then delete them, then you'll be fine, but you may lose the uh, model history of it. But I would strongly recommend downloading Fusion 360. It's a great program, and I'm going to be talking about it more in the second class I teach. Which, shameless plug, is a week from today, same time, 5.30. Uh, exactly. We're going to talk about uh, Fusion 360, which is in that whole class and that whole series is free for members, which I think everybody here is a member. Uh, Glenn just joined, and he's a member as well, so should be good. Nice. Okay. Well, as of right now, do you guys have any questions about any of this? Um, what else can Prusa do slice-wise? Because that was very cool. Um, yeah. Any other, else? I guess, tips for slicing in Prusa? Yeah. Let's see. Okay, I have a pretty cool one. You can actually do some really cool things when you use uh, painting of layer changes. Okay, so this is from a UFO lamp that I made. And so basically what I can do, or I'll start off by saying that uh, layer changes often leave like a little article behind on prints. So here, I actually have a print right here where I can show you guys. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but you can kind of see where layer changes happen. And something I did for this specific model was I painted it in a spiral pattern so that the layer changes would give the model a cool appearance of like a beam, I guess. This is going to be a really rough version of it, but you'll get the idea. And you can make the layer changes more pronounced by making it a higher retraction at layer change, which would be under print settings. 
which retraction basically is when it pulls out the filament while it's printing. So usually when it's moving around or something, it'll just pull the filament back a tiny bit. Let's see if it shows up good. Well, the layer changes aren't really showing up for me. Usually it does, but I'm not sure what the issue is there. But basically you can have the layer changes happen or you in certain areas, or you can just hide it kind of. So like what a lot of model modelers or printers will do is they'll go in here to Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scene position. Yeah. And so you could set it as random and then it will place them wherever it wants. But yeah, Prusa Slicer overall is an extremely versatile tool. Yeah, you can pretty much change any setting you could with regular slicer. But like I said, if you're trying to print anything on the enders in the makerspace, you really don't have to change any of the settings because the base ones that they give you here are just good enough. Okay. So do you guys have any questions? Yeah, so when uh, you were to take something from Prusa Slicer to print something in the makerspace, how would you do that? Do you still just, are you still just going to export an STL then from Prusa Slicer or is there a different procedure? No, nah, so it's called G code. And just right here at the bottom, once you slice it, all you got to do is click export G code and put it on the disk or okay. the uh, drive. It's pretty simple. Uh, G code is different from SDLs because it's just like machine instructions, like CNC's yeah. work off of G code if you're not yeah. aware. And yeah, yeah I, I am familiar with G code. I've done enough with CNC's. I wasn't sure how I went from Prusa to the Ender. Oh so yeah, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, it's also pretty useful to be able to see all this here where it will tell you how much time is being dedicated to certain things like for example the external perimeters are these walls right on the outside that you'll see and the infill is just the inside so say the external parameter or perimeters were taking nearly the entire time, then if I go in here and go to layers and change how many shells there are, it will take less time. So there are like little things that you'll pick up while using Slicer. But like I said, if all you want to do is print on the printers here, that's all you really need to know. And also right here, you can kind of see the last little portion of the G code. Also, I guess something I forgot to mention is, say you have a G code and you're not quite sure what it is, you're able to preview it right here in the G code previewer, which is a extremely useful tool. That's that's actually very handy. Yeah. You're at something similar, but it takes forever <laughs> to operate. Mm -hmm. I think it was more about it like it's an afterthought than it was the main feature. That's super useful. Yeah. But you can download Prusa Slicer on your computer at just prusa.com slash software, I believe. And yeah. So you don't need to have like a license or like something to have it available for you to download? You can no, anyone can use it. Okay. Yeah. It's good to know. Okay, everyone. Well, getting back to Tinkercad. Oh, new. oh yeah, thank you, Benji. So do you guys have any final questions about Tinkercad? Sorry, we're a little short on, t or going short on time. I was kind of expecting more uh, 
like the houses and stuff to take a little longer, unfortunately. But yeah, I can answer any final questions or any questions in general you guys have about Tinkercad, Prusa Slicer, 3D modeling, Fusion. Um, something I want to add, I guess, and it's not really a question, so sorry, but oh, no. when I, when I've used Tinkercad quite a bit. And one thing that I don't know if you if were clear on, but you can right click and move around in Tinkercad, but then you can hold down shift and right click and then move planes for your view. And if you don't know that shift trick, if you hold down shift and right click, it literally lets you like zoom around your object a lot, a lot easier. And then you can also use that little box on the top, the bottom, top left. It says front, down, uh, top, all that, all that stuff that lets you literally move around very quickly. You yeah. you're gonna see that top thing? Yeah. So, and Tinkercad is actually super useful, I think, in my mind, for editing existing um, models. And then I think Fusion 360, from what I know about it, and I mean, you can correct me if you're wrong is a lot better for actually if it's making models from the, from, from the get-go. Yeah, couldn't have said better myself. Okay, so yeah, this is, I learned a lot myself on here and I've been using this for a while. Anybody else have any questions? No, thank you. Pretty solid, can't wait to get using it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then also, in case anybody needs um, more hands-on experience in this, or Glenn, you join late, I did record this, um, and then so I can share this out with people. And then also, I'm, I can always help you in in the actual space in the maker space, like where I'm at now. If you come in, I'd be happy to to walk through, you know, how to use Tinkercad in the limited knowledge that I know. I know John knows more than that, but John's in here a lot too. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just in general, um, it, just because we went fast or you might have like we might have gone over something, uh, it does take a decent amount of practice to do any type of modeling. But um, Tinkercad's pretty quick to, to learn. And then next week, we're going to go over Fusion 360. What else are we going to cover next week, John? Well, I'd say Fusion 360 will cover up most of the time. Honestly, it's pretty much my bread and butter. I've been using it for five or six years at this point. So you'll learn a lot. It's what I've spent a lot of more time teaching to people rather than Tinkercad. I did that a lot in high school. So next week, if you want to come prepared, just go over to Fusion 360 and get the personal use license. And yeah, that's all you'll need. And I'll be able to cover all the basic functions of Fusion. And by the end of it, I'll have you guys make something for 3D printing here. And we'll print it off for you so you can see your design in real life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you guys all for coming out today. For sure, man. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, yeah good day, course. Okay. Um, and I will send this out to the group, to everybody else in the recording now as well. Probably also put it on YouTube as well. So thanks for everybody. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you uh, next week, same time. Yep. See you next week, everybody. Bye-bye.